my name is Jim. This is my podcast, The Bloody Vegans. You're very welcome to it. Each week, I'll be traveling ever deeper into the world of veganism, discovering along the way a multitude of viewpoints from the political and ethical to the practical. I'll be doing this through a series of conversations, each aiming to further illuminate my understanding and hopefully yours of all things plant centric. This week, it's episode 20 of the Bloody Vegans podcast. Can you believe it? 20 weeks has already rolled by. Um, and this week, uh, I'll be chatting with Sophia Ellis, uh, who is uh, a powerlifting coach, uh, also a powerlifting athlete, who's represented her country at the Commonwealth Games, uh, European Championships, British Championships, won all there is to win. Well, actually, she'd, she'd say there's a lot more left to win, and I think she's uh, dead set on doing it as well. Um, and she's done all this, uh, being vegan for eight years, uh, bucking a lot of the stereotypes that you hear out there that uh, you can't be strong and be vegan. Um, I don't think anyone uh, would contest just how strong Sophia is uh, in so many ways. So without further ado, uh, this is a conversation between me and Sophia Ellis. We start off with a kind of question I like to ask everybody, but how did you kind of first get into the world of veganism? Okay. Are we rolling already? Yeah, we're going. Okay, we're going. <laughs> yeah, we're off. <laughs> um, so, how did I get into veganism? Um, so, first of all, it was through health. Like, I... It was actually a weird one. So, I started off as a New Year's resolution to <laughs> cut out meat. Like, it was just a random one. And I just thought, why not? Because I, my family all very heavy on, like, meat-based, etc. Um, so, I thought, oh, I'll give it a try. Started feeling really good of it. And then actually looked more into the health benefits. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, this is amazing. And I, I was a footballer at the time. And, like, um, was very athletic. So, I thought well, this could benefit, like, benefit my sports, etc. cetera. Um, and, yeah, so I started doing that and I felt really good off it, had more energy, my recovery time was better. Um, and then I start, when I actually moved to Brighton, I actually found the um, more animal rights side of it. And that really hit me because I have dogs at home and stuff and I just thought what we're doing to these animals I could never do that to like my dogs and I just thought it was just kind of that moment where it all clicked and I was like wow this world is really fucked <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean don't know if I'm allowed to swear on here but sorry um, and that's where it just kept rolling I just kept doing my own research and the more I researched it the more I was like oh my god like this is crazy um We've all been fed lies, and uh, yeah, it kind of that's how I got into veganism, really. So when you, you know, when you you, you did this New Year's resolution, you had this sort of almost like a, a bet, if you like, with yeah, yourself yeah. that yeah. You, you could you could do it. Was there anyone that kind of guided you to it? Had you started to see, I don't know, maybe documentaries or like chats with friends, or was it just like purely off like my family eats loads of meat? What could I not do that? You know, it was yeah, it was kind of off my own back, but it also like looking back at it there was an underlying like mental health issue as well I think because at that time I was purely focused on getting healthier myself so I was looking into like different diets and stuff that I could do to get healthier and then I started like cutting out stuff and eventually I got into anorexia which the veganism did not cause it was a really weird mix at that time of like really falling in love with the whole ethics of veganism and everything but then have an underlying like eating disorder as well so I can the veganism did not start the eating disorder it was like through trauma like past childhood trauma and everything um but it was it's a really weird one and I can't really put my finger on like the main thing that kind of pushed me but it was a mixture of my own like ethical like standpoint as well as well as the health benefits yeah. and then as well as me like cutting out stuff so it was a real like weird mix if yeah. you know what I mean yeah and once you got to to Brighton did you kind yeah. of like find a community there I mean I know oh it's, my God, it's it was synonymous amazing. with veganism so yeah it was 
it was so nice actually because South End, I was living in South End at the time, they just didn't really have it. Like I was having to walk around with a baby sippy cup full of soya milk just to put in my coffee. Um, and yeah, Brighton was amazing. Uh, there was so much more veganism, like vegan options there, and the people were just so open and like no one would really judge you or anything like because in South End if I said that I was vegan people just laugh at me like they didn't even know what it was um so yeah Brighton was definitely helped push me in the right direction um but also in Brighton it was at my worst stage of my eating disorder so it was like yeah <laughs> yeah and how did your friends and family react to you kind of going vegan um so my dad didn't really understand it at all he was still the person who i'd come home and he'd be like oh yeah so i've left a steak for you in the fridge I'm like, yeah <laughs> thanks dad, still vegan, dad. <laughs> yeah. uh, um my mum was actually cool with it like she actually went vegetarian um and the more that she spent around me the more she went more vegan um at first my brother was really against it and then I think it was more so when I first went vegan and found all the ethical side, I was really militant. Like you get so angry and all, just you look back at everything that you've been told and you're just like, why have I been fed all these lies? And um, I just got so angry with how the whole industry is run and it just really upset me seeing how we mistreat animals and we're like basically mistreating the planet. Um, and so that's when I started doing a lot of activism as well. And yeah, I I did realise that that way of doing things wasn't working. And it was actually when I stepped back and just started just doing me, that's when my family started accepting it more. And like my family are always very accepting, but they were more open to the idea of it and more open to trying things. That was when I stepped back and started like getting stronger as well and obviously recovered from my eating disorder because I guess they saw veganism equals eating disorder, if you know what I mean. Um, so no one would really want to try it if they saw like a skinny person. Being, but now that I'm strong and I'm doing what I'm doing, they're like, oh, okay, it isn't the diet, but it's actually like the diet's helping now as well. Um, or lifestyle. So that's when, yeah, my brother's really open to vegan options. He eats like half of his diet is vegan. My mum's basically vegan. So yeah. 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 Well, I think you make a really like, you know, I, th I think a really important point there that like, first of all, like veganism is not a diet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's a lifestyle, not a diet. Yeah, totally. And like people get, people get that kind of confused all the time, don't yeah. they? Particularly, I think, you know, when you talk about the idea of, um, like an eating disorder, like, and I've had a, a little bit of experience within, you know, my family, um, you know, some, somebody really close to me who, who's gone through that journey. And, you know, and I, I wouldn't ever profess to have your level of knowledge being inside it, but it, it's certainly like as a, as, a, as a family member, you look for anything to point at that's the cause of it. Yeah. Um, because uh, you just want to help that person. And so I, I could imagine it'd be really easy for a family member to label, well, it's the veganism. Like, if we could only get her off the veganism, she'd... Yeah. But I suppose seeing you come out the other side and use it as, actually, it's a tool to help me recover and, yeah. and feel better, I guess. Like, it works both ways. Exactly. And I, I can definitely see why they thought that, because even when I was hospitalised, the doctors and the therapists, etc., all thought that saying that I was vegan was a way of restricting which I do know that people do use that um, so I can totally understand why they thought that but for me I always had that underlying belief of like the animal rights and and I, everything that I used was cruelty free and vegan so it wasn't just what I ate it was everything that I was wearing from what I was using products wise um, and that actually kind of upset me but I can see why they thought that definitely yeah, yeah. And, and sort of once you'd, you'd kind of started to overcome the eating disorder did, and, and they saw you kind of thriving on a, on a vegan diet and a plant-based diet, did they, did they kind of then start to embrace it fairly, fairly kind of comfortably, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, 
and because I was a lot more laid back about everything in terms of I wasn't in their faces or because yeah. like even if my brother was to eat some kind of meat I'd just tell him everything that that piece of meat has gone through like <laughs> right in front of his face yeah. and he didn't appreciate that which I can also understand um, but now that I'm just yeah I'm just doing me and I'm everything that I've achieved and has been through like I have been eating a vegan diet and they've seen that um, and so yeah they they want to try it as well and they can see that it's obviously doing I'm doing well off of it um, alongside obviously my training and like, a lot of components but yeah and did this coincide with like the strength training was it around the same sort of period that you got into it or had you always been into strength training yeah so obviously I used to play football and athletics and all that and then I got diagnosed with anorexia and bulimia and that was for about happened for about six years so I couldn't really do any sports so I was very weak and everything um, and when I actually got discharged from hospital um, I got given a free gym membership because I was classed as like disabled which is so weird but um and that's when I started getting into weight training and I just loved the feeling of being strong because I'd been weak for so long and it just was my own little zone to just focus on me and because I'd always been so isolated in my room at uni or whatever just because I didn't want to be around anyone I didn't feel like anyone wanted to be around me um, because of how this disorder just consumes you and yeah when I got into weight training I just I don't know, I just felt like me again because I hadn't been me for so long. And um, the amount of effort that I was putting into the gym, I was like, I need to fuel this and I want to I want to be someone else now. Like, I want to get out of this like corpse that I've basically turned into. Um, and yeah, so then the eating got better when I started strength training and... For me, the strength training, like the powerlifting, really took away the focus of what I was looking like and more so like what I could do. And the stronger that I was getting, the more I had to eat and better I had to eat. And it just built a better relationship with food for me. So, yeah. Yeah, you started to see it as fuel for yeah. your passion. Exactly. I saw it as fuel. It's like nutrition. It's nothing else. I wasn't seeing it as a number anymore like I used to or good and bad like there wasn't none of that like it's the same as life right nothing's black and white and it was just taking a more balanced approach on it um I also did my yoga teach training out in Bulgaria and that 200 hours of solid just yoga really helped as well just kind of bring me back and ground me a little bit more so yeah, yeah. amazing yeah so did you did you kind of like figure out how to, to kind of like uh, get into strength training yourself once you had that gym membership did you have somebody guiding you is it like a PT kind of relationship um, so my older brother he does some like bodybuilding stuff and I asked him for some help and he gave me some links to stuff and I was just researching I just love researching my own stuff if you know what I mean um, and so I just built my own program at first and started following that and then I got introduced to a gym in Deptford called the Commando Temple and that was a strong man strong woman powerlifting gym um, so I just walked in there and found a coach and he was actually vegan wow yeah and so that's what really attracted me to him as well because it's like oh my god a vegan powerlifting coach I, I thought that was unheard of especially as a ma like a man as well I just I don't know. I was like, wow, okay, cool. And he'd also had a past of like depression and stuff like that. So he really understood me, which I I was thankful for because a lot of people just don't really fully understand mental health. They haven't really gone through it. Um, and so, yeah, I went on a program with him and he was coaching me. And I'm a very competitive person, so I was like, I want to compete. Next comp, I want to compete. And he was like, uh, okay, uh, we've, there's a comp in four weeks. So I was like, right, let's prep for it. So I did my first comp within that four weeks and qualified for nationals in that comp. So how long have you been strength training at that point? Uh, at that point, so I didn't, did my own stuff for like six months of like bodybuilding slash strength training didn't really know what I was doing just playing around if you know what I mean um, and then yeah then I did powerlifting for four weeks and did my first comp you're kidding no 
That's insane. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. It's crazy. So, had you, had you, had you, do you think you have like a natural talent for it? Like, or, or is it something that you just, like in those four weeks or even in the six months before, just yeah. worked incredibly hard at? I think, well, there's definitely some kind of thing with my genetics, obviously. I think genetics always comes into play, but I, it's, that's not solely it. Like, I really did put in a lot of work and a lot of effort, and that... I, the thing with me, I'm very all or nothing. So if I want to do something, like, I want to be bloody good at it. And so I just put my everything into this. I mean, I was still a student at the time, so I had that time to just give it everything. Um, and I did probably go a bit extreme on it at first, um, which I then found that I did have to reel it in a little bit. So, like, oh my God, powerlifting is my life, kind of thing. <laughs> when actually it shouldn't be, like it should be a part of your life, but it shouldn't be your whole life. Um, and yeah, so I just worked really hard and just dedicated to it. I think it's just the discipline as well. Like I just got myself to every session even if I didn't want to be there like I did it got it done and yeah, yeah. and then four weeks and you've qualified for for nationals right yeah and then within that year um I did another comp and managed to place I think came second in that and then in the national comp managed to break a few records and get selected for Great Britain in bench so jeez yeah <laughs> That, that's an incredibly quick journey. Yeah, it, looking back at it, it's been insane. Because even like my second year in lifting, I which was last year, um, yeah, I became British champion, Commonwealth champion, English champion with full team records, which is just insane. Wow. Yeah. So for, for people who don't know, let's start at like... What is powerlifting? Okay, yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's start there, <laughs> and then I'd love. There's so much to explore on this. Yeah, so powerlifting is uh, obviously a strength sport that specialize. We focus on the squat, the bench, and the deadlift. So it's basically who lifts the most amount of weight, and you get a total. So you have three attempts on each: the squat, the bench, and the deadlift, and then the heaviest weight that you lifted um, under the correct. Um, like rules um, it ends up equaling to a total and then the person with the highest total then wins right yeah so to put it short <laughs> yeah and so like the sort of culture of powerlifting does it, does it, does it differ quite a, a lot I'd imagine it does from um, sort of the bodybuilding kind of world like is it is it is there similarities or crossovers there's definitely crossovers from bodybuilding um in terms of, so as a powerlifter, we still have to do accessory work, which is pretty much like bodybuilding work because we want to gain mass as well. Um, mass moves mass, right? So we want to move more weight. So yeah, um, but it also those accessories also complement our free lifts. So if you were to purely just do squat, bench and deadlift, I mean, you get, you do pretty all right, but you want to be, you want to better that so those accessories are going to help especially with like weaknesses that you have in your squat bench and deadlift or in terms of your composition and stuff like that um so there are crossovers and in terms of the actual competition itself it is very different so um i mean you still have judges well, not so much judges we well, do you have like so with bodybuilding it's very subjective whereas powerlifting it's very objective like you can either lift the weight or you can't bodybuilding takes a different stance and they look for particular things but each comp they could look for a little like different thing um and that's why i chose powerlifting because i didn't want to be judged on what i look like if that makes sense like because that is basically what they're doing they're judging you on what you look like in bodybuilding um and yeah, and I just love the the powerlifting community. Like everyone supports each other. Even if you're on, you're competing against someone, you're still there's no kind of aminos, like do you know what I mean? There's no. Um, it's competitive, but you're. I don't know. It's just a supportive atmosphere. Whereas I've been to bodybuilding comps, and you don't really get that feeling at all. It's quite you against me kind of thing um, like they're pushing each other out of the way on the st on the stage it's, you don't get that in powerlifting everyone brings their own personality to the platform in, 
in powerlifting, which I really love. So yeah. And how is how's veganism received in that community? My perception would be that it's a very and this is completely naive, so 100% willing to be corrected immediately. But um, my perception is very like meat heavy, protein, protein, protein. It's that kind of world, or, um, or not? Or is that not your experience? Very much with bodybuilding. I've experienced that. Like, obviously, I haven't been in bodybuilding, but I go to bodybuilding gyms and stuff like that. Um, it's very much that in bodybuilding. Um, you don't get many vegan bodybuilders. Well, not from what I know, anyways. Um, in powerlifting, the first year of powerlifting, I definitely could see that. Um, I didn't really know any vegan powerlifters at all. But I also wasn't like shouting out that I was vegan either it was more so if someone approached me and was like oh what diet do you do especially as now I've got how the level that I am at now people you do get more people asking me oh what so what's your diet like um and that's when I tell them they're like oh okay and having those achievements really supports the veganism if you know what I mean um and there's actually quite a few vegan powerlifters now that I know of or more that have adopted like a plant-based eating. Um, and it, it's well received, I think, in the powerlifting community. I mean, I've never had any hate from it. Like, if, they, if I do, I'm like, can you deadlift what I deadlift? <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, no, it's all right. Apart from if I go to bodybuilding gyms and you just get the meat heads just talking shit but yeah. otherwise I haven't really had a problem with it yeah yeah no that's 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 awesome and, and like I say that sort of probably bucks my perception of it when you first came into it I know you had the, a vegan coach which is like an amazing turn of luck I guess yeah, so good. Uh, when you first joined um, but was your perception that that you you know when you first walked into that gym that perhaps you know, you know, I'm vegan, so I probably wouldn't be able to get like really strong and huge. Was that a perception you had, or were um, you kind of like just dead set on getting strong? Yeah, it was never an issue. I never thought, oh, my diet's going to hold me back, or like veganism is going to hold me back. I never thought that because I truly believe in it, and I never thought it was an issue. But going into the gym, it was quite. It's quite an intimidating gym if you're ever to go, but it's like a lovely atmosphere. But I did think that I didn't really want to mention it, if you know what I mean, um, in the fact that maybe I'd look, be looked down on or people would kind of, I don't know, hold me back, say that I couldn't get where I wanted to get or something like that. But yeah, I never saw it as an issue. I just kind of thought, I want to get strong as fuck, so bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> so when you, when you've, you've qualified, so we'll we go back to that point. So you. You'd qualified in your first comp for, for nationals. I guess the world of competing at that, that level or even competing at all in that sport was like totally new to you and you're suddenly thrust into this kind of national level. Like, how did, how did that feel when you first got into that, like this sort of almost like professional standing, like immediately, how did that feel? I mean, it was amazing. And I thought, wow, I've really found something that I can just be good at as well like because I've always been good at sports but I've never chosen one that I've just absolutely pushed if you know what I mean I've always been good at everything um and I was like well I've actually found something that I can really like get my teeth into if you know what I mean and it was kind of scary at first because I thought I've only done one comp and now I'm going straight into nationals like you start questioning like am I good enough or all this kind of stuff because I want to do well in it um, that's why I did a second divisional comp just to get another comp under my belt so I actually know how comps run more etc um, and then after that second comp I was like yes I'm going to do this I want to I want to be one day want to be world champion kind of mindset <laughs> um, so yeah I was yeah I, I was I was so eager and excited to just keep seeing my progression um, at first I think people can get a little bit especially me I got a little bit like keep ch chasing the numbers kind of thing but you've got to step back and realise why you're doing it I'm doing it because I enjoy it like that's the main thing I enjoy it um, and yeah be realistic but also yeah do have those goals but 
um, just take it like it's a process. Don't get ahead of get too uh, f- f- there. There, can't even speak. <laughs> Far ahead of yourself too quickly, um, because otherwise it can take the enjoyment out of it if you just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing, and to the point where you're just hitting a wall. If you know what I mean. Yeah. So when you've you've represented your country in how many how many competitions now? Oh, uh, so I competed at Worlds in Tokyo for Great Britain, uh, Europeans for Great Britain, uh, Commonwealth for England in two competitions, and England in the home nations. So yeah, four international comp, well four comps for the country, and I'm also the England assistant head coach. So. I also coached the Commonwealth Special Olympics, the Commonwealth team and the Home Nation team. Wow. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. And just <laughs> run us through some of the, the medals yeah. that you've that you've won. Oh god, date. the medals. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, it's gonna be <laughs> we might be here a yeah, while. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can reel them all off. Um so I came I didn't get a medal for this, but I came fourth in the world, which I was very happy about. <laughs> um Came second at Europeans, so silver medalist in Europeans, gold medalist bench Commonwealth, gold medalist full power Commonwealth, um, gold medalist in the British Championships, British bench championships, the English Championships, the English bench championships, all gold. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so more fool anyone who questions you on whether veganism works. Yeah, <laughs> like, come at me. <laughs> I was, was going to just talk about the activism side for a second. Because yeah. you, you mentioned when you first became vegan, you got quite heavily involved in activism. Yeah. How, I imagine what you're doing now has probably been the most effective form of activism oh, you've probably ever been involved in, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I've been through all different types of activism, like starting from earthlings to parading on the streets with signs and stuff to um I was an artist for five years, so I studied fine art. Um and I did activism through my artwork and I held exhibitions um on animal rights movements and stuff like that. Um, I've done stuff with animal sanctuaries, like all sorts. I've done it all and um, blogging, but the definitely the most, the one that's worked the most is through my lifting. And that's just been doing something that I enjoy. And I think that that's what you've got to do. Find something that you're good at or something that you're passionate about. And once people see how happy and how strong or healthy you are, they want to buy. They buy into that. They don't really buy into you shoving stuff in their face. Um, so yeah, I think doing something like that is the best kind of activism. Yeah, yeah. And have you? I, I guess the example you've set. Have you seen? Have you seen people kind of directly say, you know, thanks to your example, Sophia, I'm going to try it. And oh yeah, so much. I've had like messages saying oh like I've seen what you're doing and that you eat plant-based like I'd love to try it like even my clients will want to try it and I've given them recipes and stuff like that and it's been really nice because everyone's approached me in a really nice way as well like I'm all for people asking me questions like I will answer them but it's when people kind of um like give me abuse by like about veganism that's I'm like like, that's not cool like I don't I don't really care what you're eating so why why are you having a go at me kind of thing um but yeah so it's been really really good in that aspect yeah yeah do you you still get any of that that kind of negativity online around uh, particularly around the veganism no not at all around veganism I really especially on my Instagram like I hardly get any any kind of negative I'm, I feel like I'm really lucky because I think quite a lot of people do get negative messages on Instagram but I really haven't I think the m- most negative things I get is about my arch in benching <laughs> oh really? <laughs> that's it because in a powerlifting like uh, we ha- arch our uh, thoracic back like thoracic part of our back um, to basically reduce range of movement um which means that we can press more and it's a different style and form to what bodybuilders do. So everyone's only really seen oh. the bodybuilding style. Okay. And so then when they see us arching our backs, they kind of like give us abuse on that. Um, but that's the only thing I've really had it on. That, that. That's that's almost more odd, I think, than challenging you on veganism. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like the one thing I'm not going to be challenging you on is, yeah. is powerlifting. <laughs> I also think it's because I don't really shout about it a lot. Like, I 
post food stuff and all my stuff is vegan and everything like that but yeah I guess because I'm not constantly preaching about it that I don't really get any of that yeah yeah one thing I think um, particularly if you're trying to eat like clean and healthy and whole foods and so on um, that you that you kind of find as like in the, the kind of vegan world if you like and vegan diet in this particular case or plant based diet is um, like taking in enough calories is, is can sometimes be like a bit of a challenge if you're eating healthily um, how, how do you find that kind of like balancing that trying to eat kind of clean and healthy and trying to get enough calories to do what you do yeah so I do get a lot of questions about this actually like how to eat enough calories um, eating whole foods so on if you're if you haven't had like a passive eating disorder or whatever tracking it is quite helpful because you can see which are the most calorie dense foods um you can definitely eat enough eating whole foods um it's just a lot of volume is the thing um but you can if you eat the calorie dense foods you can also like drink your calories as well so making like smoothies and bulking them up like with bananas oats uh, plant-based milks uh, you can get even like powders that are like vegan bulking stuff but obviously that's not like, as whole foods but yeah it's really knowing what to eat and uh, researching it as well because there are those calorie dense foods and you can get in enough calories eating that whole foods uh, plant-based diet um f- for me it's been more through experience and trial and error and seeing what like my body works best off as well um so yeah i eat a mix of whole foods and then i do go out sometimes and eat the processed crap but it, that's about having balance and i've really um given myself more flexibility with my foods and what i'm eating and that's helped me mentally um so yeah i've never had an issue of not eating enough i think my problem has been eating too much sometimes <laughs> um but yeah like there's always ways around it i mean like adding sauces to stuff cooking with coconut oil or oils obviously increases your calories um but i wouldn't it's just taking a balance like i'm not saying restrict oils or restrict these things or anything like that it's having a mix of all but yeah having nuts pulses you know having a mix of foods is great yeah and what's what's a like a, a typical day and i appreciate a typical day is like can vary wildly yeah, yeah. but a, a kind of typical day's eating for you like how does it kind of start and end um okay i eat quite a lot <laughs> be here a while um so normally in the mornings i'd have oats with protein powder berries almond butter um cacao nibs hemp seeds anything that I can basically chuck on my oats um, and then I will also have if I'm if I'm bulking or well not bulking but eating in a surplus then I'd also have like crumpets with um, avocados or some avocado on it um, and a coffee and then I'd have a snack which will probably be because I'm always on the run um, I'll probably have like one of these my protein carb crusher protein bar things which are actually really good um with some fruit and then for lunch i'd have oh man it changes but something like a tofu stir fry that i'd pre-made or something with like rice or noodles or something um and then a snack with that as well and then my post-workout i'd have protein shake with a mixed with a banana um and then I'd probably make something for dinner that would be like a curry, so for like a aubergine curry or something like that. Um, and then I'd have a dessert and I'd probably have more snacks as well. <laughs> Sna- um, my dessert is probably like, I'd have yogurt with, um, sometimes I mix protein powder, sometimes I don't, um, with some cereal or something. I'm a bit of a cereal addict. Um, <laughs> and yeah, mixed berries and stuff like that so it's real real mix of stuff it really depends on my day like what I can grab hold of sometimes I'm on the run and I have to grab um I don't know a Greg sausage roll <laughs> which is the <laughs> healthiest but they're damn good um and then sometimes I'd meal prep and I'd just make stuff like really basic stuff like veggies rice my protein like Linda McCartney sausages which are banging um, and then some snacks as well. So yeah, it changes. <laughs> and, and how often do you have to train in order to 
kind of maintain the level that you want to maintain, like shoot towards the worlds and so on? So I'm currently training five days a week and then I do my cardio as well. Um, that's like twice a week and that's just for like recovery. Um, so yeah, five times a week and I usually train for about two to three hours depending on the session. So yeah. So obviously I have to eat a lot. Sometimes I even eat during my sessions. <laughs> <laughs> like if they are long sessions, I have just like some of those uh, veggie sweets, those vegan sweets, yeah. just to keep me going because you can get a bit lightheaded if you don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what is powerlifting training kind of look like because I'm again naive on the subject so um so programming wise it really depends on the athlete where they're at like beginner intermediate level whatever um but for me I squat bench and deadlift three times a week so I squat three times bench three times deadlift three times um women tend to be able to do more volume than men can so I can I'm okay deadlifting three times a week where I know that uh, quite a few of my male clients prefer twice a week deadlifting um, and then I'll do my squat or bench or whatever and then I do a load of accessory work so for example today I did some volume bench press and then followed it with a load of upper body uh, work so like bent over rows face pulls lat pull down that kind of thing yeah yeah and are you constantly like with the with the, the the kind of three that you you particularly focus in on are you constantly pushing weight to like personal best territory is that kind of how it works or do you, no. do you stick at similar weights um so we wouldn't always be hitting pbs every week because you would sometimes you would need like a deload as well so in terms of for recovery like you can't keep pushing and pushing and pushing because your body will eventually just be mm. like help me <laughs> um, um but we, I do increase the either like the volume or the intensity each week, um, and it depends. Like if I've got a comp coming up, then I'll peak for that comp. So for the at the moment, I am peaking because I've got a comp this Sunday and I've got a comp uh, the following week. Um, so I'm peaking for that. So I'm doing all my maxes, and this is where I'm in the PB territory. So that's when when you start peaking, that's when you start hitting your PBs because you start doing rep maxes and volume maxes and stuff like that and that's exciting um, but then you do come to a point where you're like yeah I really need a deload because you can feel it like there's certain things that you know when you need a deload um, and that's where you really want to get in your volume as well and start building again because you don't want to just keep maxing out every session because like maxing out um, is where you're more likely to get injuries and it just really hits your CNS like so yeah you don't want to be maxing out every session so is it a bit of a science to peaking because I, I, like again all my questions are naive so just <laughs> take that as, a, um, as read but like is there a bit of a science in terms of like say your competition's this Sunday and you're training this week and you hit a PB that would have won the competition on the Sunday or yeah. can you not be quite that precise with it yeah so there is um, it is quite you do have to have quite intelligent programming um, in terms of if you've got a comp coming up you want to be hitting your maxes like say your three rep maxes or your two rep maxes the weeks leading up to it and then that actual week that you're you've got the comp you want to probably do your openers at the beginning of the week just so that you're getting you you're comfortable hitting that opener because your opener needs to be quite fairly easy like something that you know that you can get because the worst thing is to fail on your opener like starting the competition and not get the squat that's just like it'll hit you mentally so you need to go in confident so that's why i always go a bit conservative on my uh, first attempts um and then make jumps from there. But yeah, that week you then kind of want to rest and you don't want to be doing any maximal effort that week. But because for me, whereas I do bench press comps and full power comps, they're usually close together. So I usually just peak for the full power comp and then just continue training the week of the bench comp, but just kind of like don't go too heavy on the bench and then just hit my bench press. Right, and it works in like weight classes, right? So you were saying just before we started recording about that you have to drink, was it six litres a day at the moment yeah, of water? Yeah, it's a bit disgusting. 
<laughs> so, so talk to me about like weight comps and why you have to drink six liters of water a yeah, day. Yeah, so not everyone does, and this doesn't apply to everyone. It's so basically we're in weight classes, and I sit just above my weight class. Um, and the reason being is that I sit comfortably here and I feel that I'm at my strongest here as well. So I, my training is better when I sit at this weight. Um, so then for comp, I basically water load and water cut. And that's where I will just lose water, la- water weight for weighing. But because the water is much more easily replenished than fat or uh, muscle um, I can't really gain muscle mass in within the two hours <laughs> after weighing whereas you can with water so I'd water load that week um, drink between five to six liters of water it used to be less it used but now I've got more muscle mass I can hold more water um, and then the day about 16 hours before comp I would stop eating and drinking and basically my body would just keep weighing out even when I'm dehydrated um so then when it comes to weighing the next morning I will be lighter and I'll be under that weight clot like under the number that I need to be um and then as soon as I come out of weighing I will get on electrolytes um salt easy digestible carbs creatine anything to get my body absorbing water again because I don't want to be doing I will be slightly dehydrated for the comp but I don't want to be extremely dehydrated for comp because it can affect your performance like I have also competed in the higher up weight class so for the Europeans and the British I can competed in the under 84s but I weighed in at 73 kilograms so everyone was like 10 kilograms heavier than me um still one though um (laughs) um, but it was nice being able to eat and I didn't feel lightheaded or anything like that so I've I've had good it depends how it goes and if you do it properly if you do it properly you should be fine I would never recommend cutting more than five percent of your body weight in water like I would never let my athletes do that um, because that's when it becomes unhealthy. And at the end of the day, health is a priority. Um, so, yeah. I see. Makes <laughs> sense. It makes yeah. perfect sense. It's kind of like boxing, but we have only two hours between uh, weigh-in and the actual competition. Yeah. So you haven't got the day, the night before, like in boxing, to yeah, no, to we don't have that. Eat as much as you like. Sort exactly. Of thing. I see. Makes sense. So, when's when's the kind of that's your, I guess your goal is the world championships, right? So, yeah. when is the next kind of round of that? When no. do you when do you kind of get to compete in that? So, last if you basically if you win the British Championships, you get selected for um, squad sessions for GB, which where you'll be taken, you'll be going to worlds the world championships obviously i won the british championships last year but i won as a junior lifter and now and my birthday's in january so now i'm a senior so i'm not actually allowed to compete at worlds this year as a junior because i'm now a senior so i have to compete in the senior british classics to then see if i can be selected for gb for worlds um obviously for seniors it's 23 years up to like 40 something years so that's a massive open category where you've got a lot of competition and you tend to peak when you're around 30 so obviously it's always in any sport it's going to be hard for a junior going straight up into a senior so for me to even podium this year would be amazing um I want to win the British Classic British Classic bench this Sunday for me to be selected for the GB bench team. So I want to go to Worlds this year for bench, which will be in Czech Republic, I believe. But for the classic, like full power Worlds, um, I'm looking to do that of next year or the year after. I yeah. see. Makes sense. Yeah. It's a bit confusing when, when you're doing like two different like bench and full power, but yeah. That's, yeah. I want to. It makes sense. Makes sense. That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure, well, I'm sure you'll succeed. The rate at which you're going. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, if um, if somebody wants to kind of get started in this world, so they've 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 perhaps followed you on Instagram for a while and yeah. think, you know what, I, I could do that. Maybe I'm going to give it a crack. Where would they start? In terms of powerlifting or yeah. veganism? Well, a bit of both actually. I suppose combining the two definitely, but. How would they yeah. start in terms of powerlifting, I guess? And then if they were vegan as well, that would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, 
So in terms of powerlifting, I would always recommend getting a coach or some kind of program to start with. Like you can, especially as a beginner, you can get those like um, cheaper programs that are quite simple because you don't need as much specificity um, as a beginner. But then once you start progressing, I would definitely recommend getting a coach so that you can have a more detailed and specific program for you. Um, having a coach will also help you get it it just teach you everything that you need to know about powerlifting and it will help you with your form and technique and that in turn will help you feel more confident doing it in the gym by yourself um if you can't afford a coach then there are like powerlifting classes available um i know in london anyway i take i take a class um, <laughs> um so yeah for me personally a coach really helped me get into powerlifting um yeah, do your research, follow people on Instagram who do powerlifting, kind of get into that powerlifting community. Um, and yeah, following the programs so that you know what you're doing when you go into the gym and that's where you'll get the most progression as well. And also having someone have a look at your technique, like someone who is a powerlifting coach or um, you go to a powerlifting class so someone can actually look at it because with form, technique and good programming and putting the work in, that's where you'll see the progression and yeah benefits is, is there kind of particular gyms to kind of like look for obviously the one the one you're at is a good start but yeah. if you can't get to that one is there is it specifically looking for kind of powerlifting gyms or how does it work um so there are specific powerlifting gyms but there's also like strength gyms and stuff you don't have to be at a powerlifting gym to do powerlifting um you can be at any like commercial gym like a pure gym i know world champions who go to pure gym um so it's not necessary like you can have an online coach or go visit a coach now and again um for like one-to-ones but um there there's a so on facebook there's a group and it's a british powerlifting or you've got like different divisions so like greater london powerlifting so depending on what division you're in you can go on that Facebook group and actually ask and like just put it out there be like hey I'm new to powerlifting can I get some help like everyone is so helpful if you put it push your, put yourself out there like people will help you um, so yeah in London there's there's quite a few really good powerlifting gyms um, I know a few in the Midlands and stuff it's just about like searching like even if you google search powerlifting I'm sure some will yeah. come up so yeah. yeah do your research and search like your local area kind of yeah thing. yeah 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 it makes sense so I've got one kind of really broad question before we kind of wrap up I know you're incredibly busy and need to, <laughs> need to get on your way to another client um, but in terms of like how how confident are you in terms of like our probably all of our kind of end goal or ambition of us reaching kind of like a vegan world how confident do you feel about that I'm very confident in that. Like, I mean, maybe not necessarily 100% vegan, but definitely we're making, like the, I've been vegan for what, eight years now. And the amount of progress that we have made, like in terms of incorporating more plant-based options and going more cruelty-free, it's just been insane, like absolutely insane. So if we keep moving this way especially in terms of what's been happening recently in the environmental changes you've seen the flooding you've seen the uh, fires and everything like that people are now starting to become aware of what we are actually doing and the effects it is happening having on our um, planet and i really think the government are starting to kind of realize that as well now and take it a little bit more seriously so hopefully if we can keep pushing and people still keep realizing and making these little changes i definitely think it can it, it, it will only keep go, getting better from my perspective like i can't see it going backwards it can only keep getting better um so yeah 100 <laughs> percent. and and where would we go about following you if we wanted to kind of um uh, see a little bit more of your kind of training and your kind of journey yeah so you can uh, find me on instagram and it's uh, sophia strength um, I also have a YouTube channel as well, which I'm in the process of changing it to Sophia Strength, but it's still currently Sin Free Sophia, um, which is my old tag. Um, 
and yeah and if like co- coaching wise um, I hold powerlifting classes at the Commando Temple in Deptford and also one to one and online coaching so people are welcome to contact me via email if they have any questions which is Sophia Ellispt at gmail.com awesome yeah. well thank you so much for no your time worries. Sophia it's been great chatting yeah with you. you too